All right. Bismillah. Let's get it started. A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wa afdalu salatu wa atamu taslim ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa radiyallahu ta'ala ana sadid tabi'in wa ulama al-amaleen wa a'imatu al-arabat al-mujtahidi wa muqalidihim ila yawmiddin. Amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everybody. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. We are here. <laughs> Share the video. Please share the video. We're going to try to keep it a little short. A little. Little with a D. Little. A little short. We're not trying to give no cut bar. Cut bar with an R. Right? You trying to make fun of me? <laughs> no, a lot of us do it. <laughs> cut bar with an R. Cut bar. Hmm. Alhamdulillah. I'm going down my timeline and I seen a picture of a dog with a wig on it. <laughs> and it said Gail King under it. You let her have it. Oh, oh they going in. And actually, I'm not mad. Hmm. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, you know that uh, basketball player, entrepreneur, well-respected basketball player, uh, Kobe Bryant, he died in that helicopter crash. And some people who have platforms, different news anchors, et cetera, have used this opportunity to try to bring up uh, a case that he was involved in in Colorado where he was accused of rape. And uh, I made reference to Gail King. She's, a, I guess, a news anchor. Uh, mm -hmm. Very close friends with Oprah, Win Oprah, Oprah, o Oprah Winfrey, uh, and people are starting to notice a pattern. This pattern has been there, but people are starting to notice a pattern where anytime someone is accused of some sexual impropriety, rape, abuse, molestation, and they're black, you know. Oprah, Oprah and uh, Gail go after them. Like, for example, she did a, uh, Gail did an uh, interview with R. Kelly and, you know, but Robert, but Robert, he's messing up my life, man, right? Mm -hmm. But when it comes to uh, white sexual predators, they're very quiet. They're friends with, uh, what's the dude's name? Harvey Weinstein. Mm -hmm. She is a co-worker with another dude. I forgot his name. All of these people, some, some of these people, they know personally, and they are admitted sexual abusers and whatever, but they can't get no documentaries about them. No, they can't get no comments, whatever. But anytime the uh, accuser, or I mean the accused, uh, is black, they're ready to go on in. And so, and this has been a pattern with Okra and, uh, and Fail, Gail, right? So, mm -hmm. so, uh, people called them out and, uh, Snoop Dogg, Snoop Doggy Dogg, the, the rapper, he, uh, I guess went on his social media and called Gail King, uh, what? Uh, I forgot. A funky dog head A B, right? <laughs> and so... So everybody's clowning her. They tie it. So, so basically, uh, Okra and Fail have lost their uh, black card. Should have lost it a long time ago, right? Because abuse is abuse, and it's you know you shouldn't you know always shine a light on one, 
you know, when the abuser or the alleged abuser is black, but you quiet as a church mouse when they white, mm -hmm. right? But even the thing with the Kobe Bryant situation, you find that, you know, uh, I was actually listening to a, a program last week and people were calling in. They said, oh, yeah, basically, I guess he's a great person, but I just can't get over the fact of, you know, you know what he you know what he did i mean does this one bad thing and and to me this is dangerous because it's really not about kobe it's about how people will change stuff up on you and then change the narrative and use that talk about that false narrative as if it's the truth and it's a straight up lie mm -hmm. the situation with kobe bryant number one she uh she had intercourse with Kobe Bryant, Kobe Bryant mm -hmm. and then went to a party and was bragging to her friends and and about, you know, how they had sex and, you know, how good it was. And and then all of a sudden she flipped and said that, you know, she uh, she was raped and whatever. And so, you know, uh, the case was going to court. And all of her friends were going to testify against her. Mm -hmm. They were going to testify how she bragged about it, how it was voluntary. And, and now that she, she, she going to try to get this money and what she going to use the money for, she going to use the money, get some breast implants. Is she going to do this? Is she going to do that? And, and it was because of that, that the, uh, her lawyers dropped the case. Mm -hmm. See, they leave all of that out. And when they make reference to it now, especially when he's dead and he can't defend himself, oh, you just, he just, you know, he was accused of rape and then he settled out of court. And when you say settled out of court, it gives the impression that the person is guilty. Yeah. Admission of guilt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand that. A lot of times rich people and famous people, they settle out of court, not because they necessarily guilty. They settle because they, they trying to protect the brand you know, and the publicity, regardless if it's true or not, they, they, they weigh it, be like, you know what, it's not even worth it. Just give a few quarters and tell her to shut up. Mm -hmm. You know, non-disclosure agreement's over with, right? And so just because someone uh, settles, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're guilty. And and also, when they did the rape kit on this, on this woman, that they found semen from several men in her underwear. So after she had sex with Kobe, she had sex with a whole bunch of other people that night. And all of that stuff was going to come out in court. Her friends were going to testify against her about her talking and bragging about it as a proof that it wasn't no rape. It was voluntary. And the fact that, you know, she had other several other sexual partners that night. So, you know, they didn't want to go into court with all that. So they just dropped it and they, they settled. But now when you talk about it, they leave all of that stuff out. They say, oh, he was accused of rape and they settled out of court. You see all the information? Mm -hmm. When you add all that information in there, you know, you, you know something's up. But mm -hmm. you leave all of that out and you just said he was accused of rape, settled out of court. Mm -hmm. And so they, this is the way they change the narrative. And I'm real sensitive about when people change the narrative. They only tell half the truth and they leave you to uh, think something isn't what it really is. And so I, I'm real sensitive on that, especially when you're a victim of that type of stuff. You real sensitive about it when you see it taking place. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi Hassan Ali. My brother, yeah, it's about time for you to come back, ain't it? <laughs> what are you doing? Huh? <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So uh, Snoop Dogg made the made the comment about her, you know, being a, a funky dog head A B, right? And so and so that's went viral. So that's that's what I made mention of. And nowadays a lot of uh women, particularly black women, they feel like the only way that they can, you know, assert their power, some of them, is to accuse even falsely someone of raping or abusing them and leverage that 
into, you know, what we have now, the so-called Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an excellent segue into our topic because, you know, righteous women, they don't have to do all of that to exercise their power. And tonight we hope to talk about, just a few minutes, we hope to share some information about one of our powerhouses in our history. <clears throat> Her name is Asma'u. Nana Asma'u. Bint Shehu. Bint Sheikh Uthman Ibn Muhammad Ma'rufu Bin Fudiye, known as Danfodio. Nana Asma'u, the daughter of Sheikh Uthman then Fodio. So we want to spend a few minutes talking about her and not just really talking about her biography and all of that kind of stuff, but to talk about her as a woman, her position. And how she didn't have to be a feminist to be in the position that she exactly. was or have that feminist um, mentality. Exactly. See, see, we right here. See, so, I was looking for the words, and I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have said that, but she said what I intended to say better than I would have said it. Of course. Alhamdulillah. Wa alaykum alhamdulillah. So just a little background. Nan Asma'u bent Shehu Uthman Den Fodia. She was born in 1793. Um, she died in 1864. Um, she was a twin. Um, her brother... She had a brother. Her twin was a, a, a male a male child, and his name was um, Hassan. Mm -hmm. And they were the 23rd and 24th child of the Shehu. The child, uh, the Shehu had 25 children in all. Um, when she was very young, her mother died. Her mother, Maimuna, died. And so the Shehu, he had other wives named Hawa and Aisha who took the reign and took her up under their wing and they raised her as their own. Um, in that household, um, it was a Muslim household. You know, the, the norm, a household should look like learning Quran, memorizing Quran, you know, learning all the different aspects of Islam, fiqh and such. So that household was based on learning. It was known for that. And so, uh, since uh, education was so deeply rooted in the family, um, Nana, in particular, she knew several languages. She knew Arabic, she knew uh, Fulani, she knew um, Hausa, and Tamachek. Is that how you say it? I don't know, but yeah. Okay. All right. And she was a Hafiza. So, she, she memorized the whole Quran. And she was a woman. She was a girl when this occurred. So this is not just something for males. This is not just something that uh, a status that only a certain um, gender could achieve. She achieved that. And it was encouraged in her household. You know the beautiful thing about this? What? And I think it's a good place to mention it. I was watching a live today. Uh, Imam Lukman Ahmed. May Allah protect and preserve him. He did a live last night, and I was just watching it a couple hours ago. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about uh, dealing with our situation here in America. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about the continuity of the it's generational continuity in our families, passing down Islam to your children in a practical way, right? Mm -hmm. And he was talking about how Shaitan would want you you know, you become Muslim, all right, and it just stop with you. Mm -hmm. You're not able to transmit the deen to your children and to their children, and you d naturally develop a clan, mm -hmm. right? And he said that he had he talked about this trend, and, and I know you've seen people talk like this. They they be like, you know what, you know, my child, you know, I'm going to give them the choice to be whatever they want to be when you know they get older. Whatever, you know, I'm not going to quote unquote force Islam on him. And he was like, no, man, I'm Muslim, you Muslim, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And this is a good example of that. The Shehu didn't do that. But the example, it made me crack up. And this is, and this is a perfect analogy he gave to that. Mm -hmm. He said, this, this Imam Luke, man, he said that that's like us. Mm -hmm. 
we come out of the fire. Mm-hmm. We we in the jahiliyyah, we get our hands burnt in the fire. Mm-hmm. Like, whoa, that's hot, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now we have children and we be like, you know what? I think you should be able to burn yourself in the fire too to see, see, to see if you see if they want to continue to get burnt or not. Just I mean, and, and and that's a that's an appropriate analogy because Allah uses the same analogy in the mm-hmm. Quran, the Surah Ali Imran, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Allah saved us from the fire. Mm-hmm. Allah saved you from the fire, and you became Muslim. And here you take your child to be like, you know, you you can make up your own mind. So, so, you know, I'm going to expose you to the fire if you want. You know, subhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Wa alaykum as-salam. Wa alaykum And so you can see with the Sheikh's family, and we're talking about one of his children, uh, Nana Asma'u, that you didn't have that choice. Because if, if she would have raised, if he would have raised his children like that, she wouldn't have memorized Quran. She wouldn't have done all of these things. Because these things, for the most part, unless you got that strong mujahida, you got to get when you're young. Mm-hmm. So she got it when she was young. So she this is very young. important. You know. And also I wanted to point out is that he had other wives. Mm-hmm. And they were on the same page. And that is a, uh, a plus. That's one of them perks. When y'all all on the same page mm-hmm. and y'all teaching the children, the children is what's more important, regardless who birthed the child. The children are important to, you know, instilling them good mannerisms, you know, um, the fear of Allah, you know, the hereafter and all of that good stuff. You know, everybody got to be on the same page. And so, you know, brothers have to be mindful who they marry and who they bring into their family mm-hmm. because they... Because that person may do more harm than good. You know, you're like, well, you know, brother want to just marry, but what does she bring it to the table? You know, and she don't, she don't have to have a whole bunch of Dean. She has to have Dean, but she has to, you know, be open. And if y'all serious, you know, she needs to be open and not think about herself coming in, mm-hmm. you know, because the husband be like the focus, you know, of the situation than the family as a whole and the children and such. So, alhamdulillah. So, this was an example of that, you know, that the uh, the women came together. Not to say they didn't have any issues, you know, but the children came first. Um, her name, she was named after the companion, the best friend of Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, uh, daughter uh, Asma bent Abu Bakr mm-hmm. and uh, so th- like I said she 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 was named after her and alhamdulillah she had a great relationship with her brother Muhammad Bello who was the second in command after his father and became the Khalifa after he passed yes and they were so tight that Nana married his friend, uh, Gadadu. Gadadu. Uh-huh. Gadadu. Okay, so, you know, her brother, you know, was friends with this person and she was able to marry him. So he, mu- he must have, um, what's it called, vetted him. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? If that's your sister. Or what have you, you know, if you're looking out for your family, you ain't just going to marry them to anybody, mm-hmm. you know. And this person, she married, and they were together, you know, you know, they were together, had children and everything. Yeah, he was a secretary. He was the, the uh, cat. Mm-hmm. And so, um, let's see here. Um... Being who her father was, he was about teaching, just like the Shehu, his father was about teaching. Mm-hmm. And he used to, you know, have, uh, have, his father used to have him around when he, you know, went around and taught the people. And so this was the habit, um, this is the characteristic that she, you know, um, inherited. All of them did, but we're talking about her in particular. And so because she was a woman, it did not stop her. From holding that position. She wasn't told to stay in the back. She wasn't told to listen. Get in the kitchen. You know what I'm saying? She wasn't you know. um, Oppressed like people would think. As you know Muslim women. That we don't you know. We don't have the intellect 
to be able to do things. You know, we have a, you know, we have a lot to offer, you know, and a lot of the scholars that have came, come out of, you know, um, in the past were from women. Women made them who they are. I think it's good to mention here, we have to be careful of taking on other people's baggage. Mm. Every every people has a baggage, mm -hmm. have some negative baggage with them, including us. But we don't need to take on other people's baggage. And what I mean is that Islam in the African experience, we don't have the fitna of oppressing our women. Like we know it's, it's documented I eat in the Quran, the Arabs treated their women very bad. It wasn't until Islam came that you know that the women were liberated they used to literally bury their women alive yeah literally they were misogynists they yeah. hated they hated, hated females exactly that's like you know like on the movie the message mm -hmm. remember when uh amr bin al as when i did mm -hmm. came to abyssinia well the mm -hmm. actor actor that played mm -hmm. came to abyssinia mm -hmm. to get the sahaba and then jaffer mm -hmm. you know ibn abi talib was like you know women are equal and and uh and I'm gonna be now. I said, "Women equal to us?" <laughs> right? It was mm -hmm. it was a joke to them. Like, right. no. And he said, "No, women, we use them." I forgot what he said. We use them. We we dis we that we right. enjoy them, and then we discard them. Right. And, and then he said, "You know, this is the, the movie depiction." Mm -hmm. He said, "Uh, uh, I'm gonna do you disrespect the womb that bore you?" Mm hmm. And then Amr was, he ain't had no comeback for that. Mm -hmm. And then Jashi said, ah, Amr, your many gods are speechless while his one god is, <laughs> is very eloquent, right? <laughs> right. Was, Women, we use them, feed them, clothe, clothe them, them, discard them. them. Right. Women, equal to us? Ha, 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 Right, so even in the Arab culture, mm -hmm. they have that in their jahiliya. And when Arabs, when they don't practice Islam, and this is with any people, when they don't practice Islam, they go back to their jahiliya. Mm -hmm. So, when Arabs leave off the teachers of Islam and want to cherry pick what part of Islam they practice, you see they oppress their They're women. Oppressing the women, yeah, because that's in their jahiliya. Mm -hmm. With the Indians from the subcontinent, and that's mm -hmm. includes the Pakistanis and the Bangladeshis, mm -hmm. they have an, a, a, a jahiliya of oppressing their women. Why you got your hand all in front of my face? Because I'm oppressing. <laughs> you. <laughs> I'm kind of hype right now. Yeah, I know you all hype. That's why I'm like, you all like, ah! So they have, like, like for example, when a, when a woman among among them, when, when she gets married and her husband dies, she has no worth. Mm -hmm. Like, she's useless. Mm -hmm. and sometimes they burn her. Right? And, and this, the whole thing of so-called honor killing comes from that. Like, right. you know, oh, you dishonored our family. Forget the Sharia mm -hmm. about you know injunctions about zina and all that kind of stuff. They got their own law that they adhere to, their own custom that they adhere to with regards to that, and they can kill their their their, their women for mm -hmm. violating the honor of the family. They ain't got nothing to do with Islam. That's their jahiliya, their mm -hmm. pre-Islamic period. Side note, uh -huh. that's one of the excuses uh, around this. Um, Remember, we was talking about hijab, mm -hmm. uh, hijab day. Mm -hmm. The proponents, the opponents of it is saying that the families are oppressing the women and forcing them to wear it. So they need to come out of it, you know, and because they don't wear it, they perform what you say. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, the honor, honor killings, yeah. but that has nothing to do with Islam. That's the apples and oranges. Exactly. And stop trying to mix it up. And, you know, confusing people to think, oh, they, you know, oh, it is, it is a choice. Oh, this is a choice that's forced on them. Yeah. And, you know, it ha and it's nothing about a law and it's deemed. You know what I mean? Exactly. And, oh. and, and again, it goes to people changing narratives. Mm -hmm. Because, like, when they talk about that, right, and mm -hmm. they make it like it's Islam right. that's doing it, right? Right. Well, what about the Indians who are not Muslim that do that? Hmm. Well, it's not just Muslims doing that. That's their Indian culture. That's the culture, right? right. Mm -hmm. And like I like I said, Islam is like a filter. Right. You filter out the blameworthy things in your culture, and what's left 
after it goes through the Islamic filter, that that remains. Islam exactly. don't change the culture. So if, when if when when they're really practicing Islam, mm -hmm. they, they, you know you will see that honor killing all that stuff go out out the window. Yeah. And so I'm saying all that to say that when you look at Islam mm -hmm. as it manifested itself in the African continent from the time it got there, even up until now, you don't see you don't have this big tradition of Muslims oppressing their women because that wasn't an African thing. Mm -mm. Women had a lot of power, right? And mm -hmm. and when I say power, I don't mean the way we understand it where he's out front, he's a leader. The woman's strength is is felt in the background and they occupy different spaces, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to be very careful now that we're in America and all of these different cultures come here and then people talk about, hey, you know, we have to make sure we don't oppress our women. Mm -hmm. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's not us. Mm -hmm. Even if you take us in our jahiliya, the African-American in our jahiliya, we don't have that issue. A lot of us came out of the church. Mm -hmm. The woman's not oppressed in the church. The woman runs the church. Yeah. Even though the pastor may be a man, the woman runs the church. Yeah. And it's the exact same thing with the masjid. Mm -hmm. the, the brother may be the imam. But it's the women that's behind, that's, 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 that's holding it down, the stability. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know? So we don't have that issue. So we shouldn't take on that. You know, we shouldn't say, okay, you know, where the sisters that We don't have that problem in our communities. That, mm -hmm. That's only y'all African-Americans who abandon your communities and go to the other community. Then you got to deal with that. Many of these masters, and I've been Muslim long enough to witness it myself, many of them, when they open masters, they don't even have a place for, for the, the women. women. Nope. It wasn't until the Kufar put pressure on them and embarrassed them until be like, oh, okay, wait, there's no place for the women to pray? Oh, God. <laughs> it, it, or it's like a little corner. Yeah, like, a little closet. <laughs> yeah, not even a closet, like a little corner. You know, yeah. you sit there like, you know. But the African-American, the black masters in America, we never had that problem because women were instrumental in opening up the spot. Yeah. So if it's a it's an African American masjid, if it's it, it's it's a place for women women, and a lot of times their area is better than ours. Mm -hmm. Like we got one brother, we got a, like he always want to use y'all voodoo station. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than ours, right? Nah, keep y'all behind over there. <laughs> but we don't have that issue, so we shouldn't be, you know, taking on other people's issue. You know, what's the treatment of women in your community? Don't talk to us about that. Women hold it down here. Exactly. And they represent it. Go to the go to the mother brothers. Don't ask us about that. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So, um, well, since you was talking about that, mm -hmm. uh, let's. Uh, you want to talk about her a little bit more? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, she was a writer, a pro prolific writer. Um, she wrote many works um, over forty years. And they were like prose and like poetry, you know, mm -hmm. how they were, you know, written, you know. And so, um, alhamdulillah, uh, these, I don't want to say poems, but these writings were to encourage women, their status, you know, of their, you know, their good status. Mm -hmm. It also encouraged women um, to cleanse their spiritual state because some women were practicing Bori, you know, black magic during their time. And so she would help them to say, hey, instead of following that, won't you follow Prophet Muhammad's lay was something, okay? Yeah. You know? So in her writings, they were like, dow it was like giving dawa. And it was relevant teaching. Right. It was relevant. That's one of the complaints that a lot of people, a lot of people outside of the masjid, like mm -hmm. a lot of people who advocate not going to the masjid, mm -hmm. the shaitanic dawah, call you away from the masjid. Mm -hmm. Part of their arguments is that the masjids are not teaching anything that's relevant. Mm. You know, people need things that need to be, you know, have teachings and classes and lessons and lectures on things that are relevant. And so, like you, you mentioned some of her writings that had to do with magic. Like one of the books that I love the most that she wrote is Tapshir Ali Kwan. You know, glad tidings of the brethren, because mm -hmm. it's dealing with the fadail, the the merits of many surahs of the Quran, mm -hmm. and because people try to use magic, 
you know, Seher, uh, what you refer to as Bori, mm -hmm. to, you know, oh, let me make this, have this person love me. Oh, let me cure me from this sickness. Mm -hmm. Oh, let me make childbirth easier. Right? So they refer in the magic. Right. And Nana Asma was writing like, listen, we Muslim, we don't need all that. Mm -hmm. Allah gave us the cure in the Quran. Mm -hmm. You know, you if, if you want help to make your childbirth easier, recite this surah mm -hmm. at this time, and that's what that's good for. Right. Or, or if you want help with that, you know, write that surah down, and then wash, and then and then wash the, that surah off the uh, off of the board into a bowl, and then drink it. It's like, mm -hmm. So these type of things mm -hmm. she was uh, she was teaching in that book, things that are relevant. Mm -hmm. And that's 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 an important point that we shouldn't miss. She just wasn't writing just to show how scholarly she was right. and how she, how deep she was. She wrote for the needs of the people. Exactly, and also um, with that, um, she started this um, education department called Yantaro, and so it was a system that was set up where. Those uh, mothers, you know, women that weren't able to go out to learn, she would send um, teachers called Jajis to their home to teach them, teach them their dean, teach them how to run their household, just, you know, like ec home economics, things like that, spiritual, ec you know, uh, you know, spiritual needs and all that good, good stuff. And then in turn, uh, these women that were receiving this education would give Sadaka to bring back to, you know, to help you know, this um, system of learning. And so it worked. And that is something that, you know, um, will work in any society where you have women that can't come out. You know, they may have, you know, situations where they want to come to the match and they come, can't come to the match. It. So you will have someone to come out to her home and things like that. You know, during these days and time, you know, it would be something that would be beneficial, you know, something, you know, to develop. But, um, the one thing about it, it wasn't something that had to be set up to separate themselves from the men. Right. Okay. This is not a, a woman's thing. This was a communal thing because you strengthen the women, you strengthen the community. Right. It goes hand in hand. It ain't just, we don't need the men. We do our own thing. And that's not, how, that's not, that's not what this is all about. And that's not the thinking that we should you know, um, entertain because it's dangerous and it leads to other things. It leads to other things until you find yourself out there and what you're going to do. Okay. So for instance, the, the suffrage move, movement. Now, you know that the suffrage movement was when, um, the white women were just, you know, just to break it down, to dummy it down. They had issues with their white men. Their white men wouldn't allow them to go out to vote and do anything. So they had issues with their man. In that, on the other hand, our black sisters want to jump on board and made and, and was told, your, your man is oppressing you too. You need to come on board with us. And some of us, you know, not knowing any better, jumped on it as if that was something that was to give her status. And instead, it widened the... Um, the, the 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 divide between you know the um the man and the woman i'm talking about as far as the black family right you know because it, it stems from back in slavery our th there was no real family during slavery the women were being raped the men were being pimped out the children were being you know separate from their families it was just it was just chaos and so when finally when the laws relaxed regarding uh, slavery and things like that, it was time to pick up the pieces. And so after all that trauma, how do you um, expect people to recover from that when it don't, it doesn't get addressed? Like to this day, nobody, nobody want to talk about it. Everybody's like, oh, that was a long time ago. Why you keep talking about it? Because it has never been addressed and it have never been resolved. There was, there was no closure to that. So that's why we keep talking about it. And we're going to keep talking about it. And may Allah allow us to keep talking about it mm -hmm. until it get resolved. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is our history. So back to the suffrage thing. So the white woman wanted to do this their thing and get the black woman on board. And so the black women got on board. Some of them got on board. But the thing about it is they didn't even pay attention. The white women didn't have the same issues as her. During that time, you were being, you know, uh, being, um, 
uh, being, it was, a, she had a racial component. You understand? The white woman didn't have a racial component. Nobody was being racist against her, you know, you know, being prejudiced against her. The black, white, black woman was uh, suffering that. But the white women were not addressing that. That was not their concern. Okay. And so they were more, they were on the side of white supremacy. Because um, when they used to have their marches, they used to have parades. Guess what the white women did? They told the black women to go on the back. They wanted to walk, march together, but y'all got to go on the back and march. Mm -hmm. They weren't, you know, together. They didn't integrate that. And so how do you become a part of a movement that don't even address your issues, but yet they're trying to make it seem like you got the same issues as them? And, that was, and we got tricked. And, and, and that was definitely false because the black man then, nor the black man now, is not in any, any position to oppress his woman. We we are powerless. Right. The the most the most uh, uh, the most a black man could do is domestically abuse his wife or or what have you. Exactly. And it's easy to deal with that. You pick up the phone, call the police, mm -hmm. and there's a good possibility that he won't ever come home again. Exactly. <laughs> Once they show up to deal with you. Right. So the black man has never in this in this. In this society, been in any social, political, or economic position to be able to unilaterally, unilaterally <laughs> oppress his woman or any other, any anyone else for that matter. Exactly. So, so it was, you know, it was a, a an excellent tool to separate the man and the woman, so that we can take our eye off the ball, have us fighting each other. Mm-hmm. Right. Fighting each other. And that's what you see now. Yeah. That's why it's just it's all it's like it's become a, a, a thing, a regular thing. Black men are no good. Shut them down. I don't care what, you know, shut them down. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like it's a boycott against y'all. So you're getting blackballed mm -hmm. and everybody need to jump on board. It's no no time for toxic masculinity. Masculinity ain't in no more. We don't want that around us. And it's all of a sudden now it's toxic to be masculine. Exactly. And the only people that could be masculine is lesbians, dykes, or whatever you want to call them. Butchers, whatever you want to call them. Women that's trying to be other than themselves, that Allah created them. Mm -hmm. You understand? So now we are reassigning roles now. It ain't just a man and a woman. It's a it, it's a they. I'm gay, I'm queer, I'm lesbo, um, uh, uh, all types of labels. I don't even know all these labels here, but don't include a man. There's no such thing as a straight man. There's no such thing as a masculine man. There's no such thing as leaders. We don't want them to be leaders. They need to wear a dress. You understand? They need to be uh, uh, solid. We don't want them to lead us. We don't want them to be beside us. We want to be by ourselves, and that's not natural. And you can't even talk about an issue, like say for example, an issue with with, with regarding women and we, us Muslims, we fall right into it, mm -hmm. right? Somebody could be talking about anything with regards to women, and somebody will come. Where else? Well, what about the men? Right. Because like, the, in their mind, they program. Mm -hmm. Okay, this negative thing is being said about women, so but the men do it too. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. You're not dealing with the issue. And then some men, we do the same thing now because. In our mind, we're against each other. Right. So it's like, you know, brothers be doing this, brother. Oh, man, sisters be doing that too. What about the sisters? <laughs> right? We, we just completely lost, right. man. We fell into the, 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 the dichotomy of male versus females. And, and in Islam, we don't have that problem. Not in Islam. Yeah. Not in Islam. SubhanAllah. But we, in inserting their issues, their, their way of thinking... Their paradigm, we squeezing it in, into, you know, into our reality, and and, and it's not good. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, let me see here. I think that's about it. Hold on. You said right there, she uh, amongst her sixty surviving words. Read that. You already mentioned that. You read that yeah, I mentioned that. Oh, I excuse me, my bad. Uh-huh, you all over here. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so as a black woman, I'm a black woman. I'm not a feminist. I don't support that movement whatsoever. I see that there are other feminists that are Muslim. I don't agree with that because when you are a feminist, 
you automatically saying that you're against men. And when you're black and a feminist, you are automatically saying that you're against black men. And so back to uh, you was mentioned about uh, Gail uh, Gail King failing okra, <laughs> and how they um, you know an un inappropriately you know addressing issues after the you know the demise of um, um, Kobe, Kobe Bryant, Bryant you know. and you know the other um, eight passengers on that plane. She did never come out and address Harvey Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein is, you know, has charges against them, but nobody's saying anything about that. Make a documentary about that. Yeah, they don't make a documentary about that, but all these documentaries that are coming out is against black men. Like I said, it's this this campaign. I'm not abandoning my black men. Okay? I'm not. I'm not on that boat. I'm not part of that thinking. I'm not doing that because that's the, the demise of the family. When you, you know, X out the man. You ask out generations. You understand? It, it's, it, it, it has serious, serious implications when you do that. You understand? And we have to stop jumping, like you said, on other people's bandwagons. Look at the situation. We have our own situation. We have our own economic situations. You understand? We uh that we haven't you know um, rectified you know um, our needs are not addressed but everybody needs are addressed before us we don't you know we don't we don't mean anything anymore and so it's like you know who who are we to have any complaints you know we are already um, labeled it's lazy we are labeled criminals. Um, the black women are labeled um, angry women, you know, no control of their mouths, all types of, you know, uh, condescending, you know, thoughts and uh, words that are, you know, you know, made against us. And so we're like, it's like it's this constant thing of making sure that we are not seen to be human. Because when we were in uh, chattel slavery, we weren't human. We were just like a tool, like you were a lawnmower, you know, a hoe, you know what I'm saying? We were tools. We were not looked at as human beings, and they treat us as such, and then use the Bible to uh, justify how they treated us. Mm -hmm. They use religion. They use the Christianity religion to justify why they enslaved us, had us in chattel slavery. Okay? And just think about that. They use the re religion against us. And then they took our religion away from us. They didn't allow us to speak our languages that we uh, originally had. They didn't allow us to practice our religion the way we want to be practiced. Now, yes, there is uh, Muslims in history in, this, um, in slavery like uh, Omar Ibn Said. We'll be talking about and, him uh, next week on Friday um, in Camden, New Jersey. Walek Salam to Library Katu. Walek Abbas. You late, brother. Yeah, we about to be over with. <laughs> give, give me like 50 push-ups, man. You late, bro. Right? Um, Abdul Rahman, uh, what was it? Abdul Rahman, um, the Prince Among Slaves. That's all I know. Mm -hmm. he, you know, yes, they, you know, were able to, you know, the, uh, display the Islam, but not they weren't free when they displayed it. You know what I'm saying? It was it was under, you know, under uh, some type of um, duress. When I say duress, it wasn't f freedom to do what they wanted to practice. You know, you had to sneak. You know, and and that's no way for and a human of, being. And some of them, like the ones you the ones you name, especially Prince of Dora Man Sorry, he he practiced his Islam uh, openly. Uh, uh, Muhammad Bilali, mm -hmm. Sali Bilali. You know, these uh, known people who were enslaved, they were the few who were, was able to practice mm -hmm. their religion to some degree openly. Yes, but to some degree, not freely. You understand? Yeah, I understand. It was I'm not under disagreeing with okay, you. So Calm down. Okay. You're all hype. Because you're like, you're no. acting like a feminist. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, yeah. yo, fem get that feminist <laughs> energy going in. You gotta watch out. Listen, feminine, <laughs> not feminist. Don't put that I S T at the end. Oh, and, and the thing that's important about this, this is why it's important for us to learn our religion, learn our deen. 
Because, like, we're talking about Nana Asmao, right? Mm hmm You know, she wrote in several languages, including the Arabic language. But, you know, you would figure that with all of us, all of these black people, when I say black, I'm talking about black, you know, African, Afro-Caribbean, African-American, you know, you would figure that someone or some group of people would communicate to us here about the legacy of people like Nana Asmao. Well, what normally happens? Like in the early, early 20th century, the, uh, the, uh, like 1903 to 1906, mm -hmm. the British colonized House of Land. They invaded, attacked, and colonized it. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when they come and colonize a place, they come and they set up their own system. School, they set up their own education system. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they, 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 they force their language. So that's why... Uh, ancient House of Land or modern day Nigeria. That's why they speak English because the British, mm -hmm. you know, uh, went in and conquered and set up their system mm -hmm. and they set up their education system. And in doing so, you know, you always had this, this constant flow of people back and forth from Britain. Mm -hmm. And it was some British ladies, some white women who you know, doing their job in education in Nigeria, notice this rich African Islamic tradition amongst the women and took it upon themselves to collect these works, have people translate it for them and present it to us. Mm -hmm. And so you have people like, and these are white women, Beverly Mack and Jean Boyd, you know, repackaging and presenting the works of Nana Asma'u uh, to us. And and sometimes, whether inadvertently, consciously or subconsciously, you know, when they transmit or, or convey what they've learned and benefited, you know, about from or about Nana Asma'u to us, it's through their lens. Mm -hmm. It's through their filter. Mm -hmm. Not through the Islamic filter. Mm -hmm. Not through the filter of the people who was brought up and raised in that system. So by the time it gets to us through that filter, it looks like a feminist movement. Mm -hmm. It looks like a movement that's okay with LGBTQ, mm -hmm. L, B, X, Y, Z, T, whatever, right? Right. Uh, it looks like it looks like a brand of Islam that is okay with a relaxed dress code. You can't, you can't, you can't let, you can't let nothing slide with these people. Like if you do a Google search right now, those of you who are watching right now, I want you to test what I'm saying. Do a <laughs> Google search, type in Nana Asma'u and put it in, click in images. There's going to be an image that pops up. Mm -hmm. Nine times out of ten, that image that pops up is going to be one of a Muslim woman who's not covered properly. And they, they'll tell you that it's not Nana Asma'u, but you type her up. Mm -hmm. This is that image that sticks there of this woman, mm -hmm. this black woman that's not covered properly. And if we don't learn ourselves, we'll go off the likes of every man. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right? So... And why is this important? Because by osmosis or by association, you would think, okay, since she was in line with her father and her brother and her uncle and the other scholars of the Jamaat, mm -hmm. that this image is what it must have been like to be a Muslim woman, woman in that community, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just giving this just one example, just as an example. Like, and so you would, you would think that, okay, yeah. I can, you know, I don't, I can let my, you know, you know, neck all out and everything like that. My ears be out and everything is cool, right? But when you read, when you actually read their works, you recognize that, number one, her methodology and everything was like in home. sync with her father, a brother mm -hmm. and her uncle. And for example, mm -hmm. her brother, I mean, her uncle, Abdullahi, 
then Fodio, mm-hmm. wrote uh, a tafsir, Dia Tatwil Fi Mena Atanzil, right? Mm-hmm. And we talked about hijab, right? Right. What was that last week or the week before last? When you read his commentary, because he says in the introduction of his tafsir, he says that the thick rulings that he's given is going to be restricted to the Maliki school because that's what they follow there. Right. So, and it's, when it's written like it a lot in the style of Tafsir Jalalain. It's similar, mm-hmm. right? But, so, when it gets to Surah 33, verse number 59, mm-hmm. and Sheikh Abdullah, he is explaining what Jalabibi Hinna means. He's making it clear that the, that the Jilbab, the overgarment, is what... What well, we mentioned last week, what well, all the other scholars have said, something that covers the entire body, mm-hmm. including the face and the hands. But see, if you get Islam about Nana Asma'u through their filter, they're not going to talk about that. Yeah. Because these are women themselves who are not covering, who are not men. Mani- they, they're not representing what Nana Asma'u was about, mm-hmm. but they're telling you what Nana Asma'u was about. Mm-hmm. For example... Uh, this may be a bad example. I'm using yeah. a, an extreme example. Yeah, it is. You didn't even know what I'm about to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an extreme example, right? Mm-hmm. I'll be like, say a person is a homosexual, right? And he claims to be Muslim. Now you have him giving a lecture about Islam. If somebody raises their hand, what does the Quran say about homosexuality? Mm-hmm. And the one that's talking is a homosexual claim to be Muslim, right? Mm-hmm. See, a lot of Muslims, they misunderstand the verse, the verses about, you know, mm-hmm. Prophet Lot, mm-hmm. Lut, right? Mm-hmm. See, the admonition wasn't about their sexual choice. It was about being hospitable to the guests. Right. right? So yep. they're going to they're gonna justify their own they position that. in true. Islam. That's true. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that, that's true. I didn't make that's that up. True. That's yeah. what they're saying, yeah, right? Yeah, that's true. So, so a lot of times people that don't have taqwa, they're going to use their shortcomings in their sins or their faults. Mm-hmm. And then if they're the ones that's presenting Islam for you to you, they're going to make they're going to make it seem to you as if Islam justifies their behavior. Right. So you're questioning everything. So if you have a woman that's a feminist, she's going to present Islam to you as if Islam co-signs feminism. Exactly. I hold the belief. If you have a woman that doesn't cover properly, she's going to present Islam to you as if nowhere in the Quran yeah. does Allah talk about no, what a cover. woman has to wear. Right. Right. They're right. going to justify their own uh, pathologies using Islam. Right. I would have lied. You know. So that that is true because if you type, if you look it up, according to the feminists, they'll make it look like Allah, I would have lied, is a misogynist. Yeah. And his prophet, Aoudi Bilal. Why does God got to be a right, he? Right, right. Who? I know, I, I know look to Arabia. And it's coming it from men. Hua. That's the, you know, interpreting means all he. these verses. That, men that, p- that, interpreting that's it. That's a masculine yeah. pronoun. <laughs> yeah. God has Aoudi Bilal. All of that Bilal. is sure, it's, right? Aoudi Bilal. I don't, do not co-sign nothing, none of that thinking at all. I, I don't feel comfortable when people have that thinking. And that's not my thinking. And that's just me, okay. A black woman. I'm saying this. It's that's not, a black woman. It's not just you. It's a lot of sisters that agree with you, but the, but our problem is when people are on the truth, they all of a sudden get quiet. I can't stand that. That burns me up. I hate that with a passion. <laughs> when people are on falsehood, they are loud. They're bold with it, uh-huh. and and everything like that. Then we get the truth, and we get all quiet, quiet. and. It'll be like one person out there speaking the truth, and we agree with it. We sit there real quiet, don't say anything. We get out the frame like this. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Send you a quiet little yep. inbox. I agree with what you said, even <laughs> though when you posted the comment and 200 people attacked you, I saw it. I didn't say anything <laughs> about it, but I do agree with you. Right? This is how we are. I can't stand that. I hate that with a passion. Like, ooh, I hate that. Ooh, I can't stand that. Uh, I might get we you know. we be out there sighting the moon and whatever people be clowning us on Facebook. Oh, we got technology. What you can sight the moon for? <laughs> ha, 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 ha. Right, right. Then the other email over yonder, right? He he going with the calculations and then he'll send an email. You know what you're doing is closer to the sunnah. <laughs> 
Oh, people don't have uh, courage anymore, you know. Mm. But you know, it, it it is what it is, you know. Mm. You know, glad ties to the strangers. It's mm. gonna be like a small group that's right. holding on. Mm. You know, may Allah make us from amongst them. And I'm talking about mm. all us here. That's um, mm. on on this um on this live. You know, it's it's just it is what it is. You know, and yes, they're bullies about it. Right. They're bullies about all the different movements that you see they are bullies about it and we just got to be bullied back don't be bullied yeah. stand by your truth stand by the truth which is the quran and sunnah and and, and that's it and that's sufficient you understand mm -hmm. you know it, it is what it is you know this life is short things is not guaranteed you stand by your truth because the law sees all and he will, you know, reward you for your patience. And patience don't mean just sit there. Do what you're supposed to do in the meantime. Prepare, you know, for your hereafter. Do what mm -hmm. you're supposed to do. Speak against falsehood. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to be popular. This is not a popularity contest. I don't care who agree with me or not. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it'll, it'll phase me either way. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Because it's not about that. But what we try to do here is for those people that don't have a voice, because everybody don't have a voice. They don't. You know, but they do agree. Just to let you know, you're not by yourself. Yeah. You know what I mean? We we understand. We know you out there. You, we know that, you know, you feel pressured, you know, thinking like, dang, I got children. What do I do? Like, you know, I sent them to school and the school sending me back packets of stuff about stuff that I don't even teach them. Right. You know, all types of stuff that, you know, bombard us, you know? We hear you. We feel you. We We all going through, but you know what? Don't stop. Don't stop. You know, plant your feet firmly in this dean and just do the best that you can. That's all you can do. SubhanAllah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and it does seem like it's overwhelming mm -hmm. because these groups got laws being passed. Like if you say something against them, you go to jail, lose your job. You know, you lose everything. You say something about a, against a black person or a Muslim. What's going to happen? Nothing. Nothing. And the deep thing about it is Nothing. These, these laws were originally passed, supposedly, to protect us. Right. Black now, people. it's been flipped and inverted and reverted and fell back. Everybody else got rights that, but that us. I could get locked up yeah. for saying something to, uh, uh, about another group of uh, right. group of people when the law was supposed to be to protect me. And I'm exactly. going to go to jail for it. Exactly. Yeah. You understand? As Muslims... We should be concerned about humanity, regardless of what type of lifestyle you 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 live, you choose. We're concerned with humanity. That's what the, that's what Muslims supposed to be about, right? Mm -hmm. But as a Muslim, we don't force our beliefs on. And any Muslim that's doing that, you're not following the teachings of our beloved Muhammad. Allah says in Quran, there is no compulsion. And religion. You can't force nobody to do anything. You cannot force somebody to be Muslim. You cannot force them to have a certain way of life. All you could do is teach. And that's it. The Prophet Slave of wasn't responsible for forcing anybody to do anything. He just, was just required to deliver the message. That's it. Deliver it, the message. Make it plain. You know what I'm saying? That's all that he was required. You know? So for us, we just required to give information. But you have groups that force upon you no, it's not enough to acknowledge. No, you need to in, 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 indoctrinate yourself and your children regarding this information and make it part of your living lifestyle. And no, I'm not doing that. That's against my book, Allah's book, and it's against his teachings of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I will not be bullied uh, uh, regarding that. Okay, that's, my, that's where I stand, and you should respect that. Yeah. You understand? I'm not going to sit there and be like, you know, you do you. If that's how you want to live. That's on you. But don't bully me or others to make them feel like they got to ascribe to what you, uh, how you, what, who you sleep with. I don't care who you sleep with. That is not my concern. When I go into a grocery store and there's a cashier there, I'm not sitting there talking about who she, who he, who he or she slept with last night. Who is that? That is none of my concern. I'm going there to buy some goods and be out, giving them my money and then leave out. That's all. But why we got to be so concerned with all this extra stuff? And why do our children have to be exposed to this stuff before we even um, ready to speak to them about certain things? And then on top of that, people say, well, why are you worried about who's, who's, a, who's, who's a homosexual or not? 
It's not the fact that we're concerned about who's a homosexual. I'm concerned about the fact that I am being bombarded, TV, radio, all types of stuff about it, that I'm not concerned. I don't care about that. That's not how I live. That's not how I'm raising my children. So why I have to be forced to uh, face these things? If that's the way that you want to live, then you live it. That's you. Stop bullying people. That is my concern. Stop bullying me. Like I said, as a Muslim, we're concerned with humanity. Okay? The good of humanity. Those who are poor. Those who are, you know, homeless. Those who are, you know, are hungry. As a Muslim, you should be concerned for your fellow man. We don't cut ourselves from that. But I should not have to be concerned about who you sleep with. That is, that's, that's, that's what gets me. It's this bullying. And they will not stop. The people of Lut in the Quran, if you read it, they were very aggressive. They were not concerned with those that they were performing those actions with. They wanted those two angels that looked like males. They were like, we want them. And the prophet looked like, listen, I got daughters. No, you know what I want. Allah put this in his book. If we believe in that book, it's the same pattern that we see right now. We're being bullied. I'm tired of the bullying. You understand? Let us do me. We have laws here in America that allow you to practice your religion. Allow me to practice my religion. You got laws that allow you to practice yours. You practice yours. But we shouldn't be forcing each other, you know, out your way and my way to be your way and to be, be mine. Right? That's what in Quran, right? As far as, you know, practicing the deen. That's how things should be. I know it's not. But this bullying, and that's all it is. And when you are bully and you feel like you outnumbered, you feel like you got to succumb to that. No, you fight back. You stand your ground. That's your belief. That's what you stand on, on your belief. A lot of our Muslim sisters feel like they have to align themselves with people who is trying to bully, bully us, you know, in that regards, in order to get you know, their rights or the or the, or the, or, the, or to get some power. Get kind of and, yeah, get a position. And, mm -hmm. and, and you you don't need to do that. Like I was you know, it's funny, I was talking to uh an imam last week mm -hmm. and he he mentioned that he you know he had to reorganize his uh Shura council and and he's like it's mo it's mostly women. I said mine too. Hmm. I said I re I re I reorganized mine too not so long ago, and is my is is mine too. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing here, and we we was both talking and comparing notes. It was like yeah, I was like sisters get stuff done yeah. right. A lot of times brothers sit around and philosophize and argue about insignificant points, and then when it's time to do, they got an excuse whole bunch of excuses why they didn't do, mm -hmm. you know, and stuff like that. But you know. Sisters get things done, you know, and, and, you know, and that's my advice to a lot of imams, especially if you an imam or a community and you've been in overly influenced by a lot of these, uh, uh, foreign strains of Islam, you know, you may have inadvertently inherited, uh, uh, a, a culture that, you know, tries to stifle and suffocate women put them in the background mm -hmm. you need to let that go yeah like that's not our tradition no nope. not in this country it's not it's not our tradition and when you don't know that then it's easy for you to fall into a movement that to uh, promise you independence and getting your rights and things like that when you don't even know your history you mm -hmm. are able to be you know bamboozled you have to know your history islam teaches you that you need to learn your lineage. You need to learn your history. You understand? That's your blueprint. If you don't know your history, then you just follow whatever. And then, you know, you find you hurting your own self and your own, you know, lineage. You know, so, alhamdulillah, um, subhanAllah. You know, Allah is, you know, is, is most wise when he, you know, sent Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to teach us our deen. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, doing his, you know, doing his part by delivering a message, but he did enforce on us to learn, you know, uh, you know, seeking, uh, you know, seeking knowledge from the cradle to the grave. Like that is an important, you know, pillar 
of Islam. You have to learn in order to grow and to know and get closer to Allah. It's 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 not um uh, it's not cool to be ignorant. It's not it's it's it's, it's it's no place in Islam, the ignorance. It's not. But when you are taught that you can't learn and you are dumb and all that stuff, like we were in slavery and prevented from reading and all that stuff, then you, you know, you form these habits that, you know, you get lazy and you don't want to do stuff. And then you have people that do like the extreme. If uh, they, they get it and the ones that's not getting it, you know, they look down on them and so they try to, you know, help them up, encourage them to be better. We got this bad habit of looking down on our, our brethren, you know, instead of trying to lift them up and just like throwing them to the side. If you ain't here up here with me, then you ain't no good. That shows how good, no good you are because you looking down when you're supposed to be trying to raise up the best that you can. So Pamela, but that's about it. What else you have to say? I'm finished. Are you finished? Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Anybody have any um, comments, questions, or anything that you would like to add? Um, like we said, we didn't want to, you know, come too long. And alhamdulillah, we kind of keeping our promise. <laughs> but um, we apologize for not coming in last weekend. Um, it was kind of busy. It was kind of hectic. So alhamdulillah, we're here before you today. Um, inshallah, um, as the imam I mentioned there is a program on this Friday coming up at Kuba Masjid and uh, uh, Islamic Center mm -hmm. um, in Camden, New Jersey. It's a free event. Please join us there. Um, the topic is um, Black History uh, uh, as it relates to Islam. Islam. Don't nudge me. <laughs> I got I <laughs> that to help you to <laughs> nudge you to help me. As it relates to Islam, mashallah, um, inshallah, it'll be a, you know, um, a beneficial topic. And like you have mentioned on your page, we, it's not it's, uh, black history just because it's February. It's black history every day. We should always be talking about, you know, this as a people, you know, to encourage us and encourage our, you know, our position. Because it's, you know, when you are told that you're not good enough and you got to do certain things to enhance yourself to be better other than your natural self, you know, it, you get, you get lost, you get lost. Look all the type of things that women have to go through these days just to, uh, portray beauty, all these shots and surgeries and, you know, uh, enhancements, you know, all over the place that is not natural. All for all in the name of beauty, trying to fit in and try to you know compete with her, you know, with other women. You know, women. You know, a lot made women in different shapes, sizes. You know, complexions, and all types of stuff. You know, and and that's a beauty in it. A lot didn't make us all the same. You understand? He didn't make all men the same. He didn't make people in general all the same. We're different, and he says that in his book, and that's his, one of his signs. He didn't even make our languages the same. And this is from Allah. This is from his signs. This is from his power. No one could do that. We're not in charge of who we, what we look like and how we talk and things like that. He is. He written it for us before we even got here. If you don't understand that, then you feel like you have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to do anything but praise God, trust God. Uh, worship God, you understand? Raise your family, you know, be upright. That's all that is required of you, but we feel like we got to do extra stuff. That's not enough. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a shame. It's a power. <sighs> but anyway. Close out. Oh, he got me closing out. Nah, well, you close it. Well, like, salara, salara, well, well, you, man. Alhamdulillah. Y'all may do it for me. I be getting into trouble with the gay community for saying what I want when they flaunt that foolishness in front of me. <laughs> Subhanallah. Yeah, we are keeping your doers. Yeah. They, they, you know, they do that 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 reverse. It's not reverse psychology. They Play do. Yeah, they, they, they they weaponize victimhood. Mm -hmm. They impose what they're doing on you, and then when you say I don't agree with it or that's not me, stay the way. Then you you're homophobic and you're attacking them. Yeah, you're attacking. I'm not attacking I'm not you. I'm over here doing me. Yeah, I'm not homophobic. You, you're imposing your stuff on me. Right but now, I'm attacking you. Right. You know, get out of here. Yeah. So that's bullying. That's that bullying. Yeah. 
Now you um close out because last time you was on, you just got up and left me right here. No, you not. <laughs> no, you no, you close out. Look, you close out. Alhamdulillah. I'm glad you all listened. I'm, basically, we what we wanted to do, we wanted to use Nana Asma'u as a platform to talk about, or a template to talk about how women thrive, you know, in, in an Islamic community. They don't have to go outside of the Islamic community to find their place. And we didn't, I don't think we mentioned it here, but Nana Asma'u, she was communicating with other scholars from other emirates and Kilafit, she was communicating with the Ottoman Kilafit and all that kind of stuff. And she, she nobody told her stay in your place. Right. You know, go you know, make some dinner for the family night, you know, mm -hmm. cook, whatever. Mm -hmm. That was her place. Mm -hmm. And one thing that you that you that a lot of us don't understand and respect about Islam is that connection to the Quran. You know, because all the knowledge that anyone have, if it's not based in the Quran, it's just useless. Right. Right. You just like any non-Muslim out here. But when, as Imam Lukman always says, that scripture talk, mm -hmm. if your ill is your knowledge is connected to the Quran and the Sunnah, mm -hmm. and you increase your knowledge, the only th only do I in the Quran where we ask Allah more of something is knowledge. Rabbi mm -hmm. zitni ilm. Right. Our Lord, uh, my Lord, increase me in knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you will recognize mm -hmm. about this dean is that as you increase in knowledge, Allah will elevate your rank. Regardless of who you are, what country you're from, what your skin color is, whether you're male or female, Allah will elevate you. And Allah will take you to places that you couldn't imagine yourself have been, mm -hmm. have gone with, with that knowledge. And so, uh, what they, they say, knowledge is power, knowledge mm -hmm. is the key. You can see that phrase, knowledge is power, with Nana Asma'u. And it's the same It's the same with us here. That didn't stop 200 years ago. It's the same right now. Right. A lot of times we want what the people of the past have gotten, but we don't want to do what they have done. We want to be ignorant, but we want to be like Nana Asma'u. Mm -hmm. We want the respect for the disbelievers, but we we don't want to. Well, we, we're scared to uh, defend ourselves when they attack the, attack us, whether that be spiritually, intellectually, or physically. Mm -hmm. We we want what the Sahaba got, but we don't want to do what they done. You know, we don't want to we don't want to put in that work, and you know, that's that microwave society. You know, yeah. but 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 the point is, we just wanted to use Nana Asma'u uh, as a platform as a template to show uh, just one out of many examples of how this woman, she used or not even used, ex exercised what Allah gave her. And she was a powerhouse and she represented not only her family and the community, but represented Islam well. And her, you know, her legacy is with us today. And I, I forgot. I, I forgot to mention. I think it's because my wife interrupted me when I was talking, right? <laughs> she, uh, one, one of the problems uh, in in the Muslim community, especially as it relates to Black people in general, a lot of our scholars they write for selfish reasons, and I don't care if they don't like me when I say it. They write it when they write. They uh, uh, they're writing books and they're translating this and they're translating that. They're not doing it for the common people. They're doing it for their PhD. They're doing it for their scholarly colleagues. And then they want to look down on the rest of us when we're ignorant of our legacy. Mm -hmm. Right? You ain't translated for us. I need a dictionary to read the introduction. A dictionary, a thesaurus, everything. Just to get past the first paragraph. You're not writing it for everybody. You're writing it for your scholarly colleagues. You're writing it to guarantee your, your place in academia. You're not writing it for the common people. And so when these people come and you know other people who don't have our best interests come repackage and remix our legacy and present it to us, then we want to get mad why our people couldn't, do, couldn't have done it. Our people do do it, but they don't do it for us. They do it for selfish reasons. And so... Uh, once again, we just wanted to uh, 
illustrate how Nana Asma'u used her knowledge not to brag to other scholars about how knowledgeable she was, but to benefit the Muslim men and women and, the, and, and the, just the common people in the society. The people benefited from her. Her, her knowledge that she wrote and spoke about was relevant. Okay, y'all new Muslims, y'all want to practice magic? Why are you practicing magic? Magic, Because you see some benefit in it. Mm -hmm. You think by doing this magic right here that Allah is going to give you this. Did you know that the Quran can give you the same thing? Here, I'm, here's what Allah and his messenger said about this ayah and what it can do for you. Recite it like this. Uh, write it, wash it, and drink it like that. And this will give you that same benefit that you're going to that magic for. So her information was relevant. And we have to become relevant. We have to become relevant. We have to be relevant. And may Allah increase and give us more Nana Asma'us. And we didn't have to talk about Nana Asma'u. She had other sisters who was uh, just as good who was equally scholarly. We didn't even have to talk about that community. We could have talked about uh, many other communities. We we could have talked about someone like everybody's talking about Malcolm X. We could have talked about his sister, Ella Collins, mm -hmm. what she represented, you know, the, who paid for his hajj, who was running a Quran and Arabic school, you know, who, who was kicked out or slash left the Nation of Islam and, and started an Islamic school. She started a madrasa. Malcolm came to her for the money for Hajj. You know, so, you know, we could talk about a lot of women who didn't, who, who didn't have to go down this white supremacist uh, feminist route to benefit the community. Like, we, like I said in the beginning, that's their problem. Black people, that's not our issue. We shouldn't inherit their issues. If the Jahili Arabs want to oppress their women, that's them. We did. That's not my. That's them. They did that in the, their Jahiliya. And the ones who claim to be Muslim, but you know, it, you know, is going back into their Jahiliya. That's when you see the oppression of women from them. The Indians in, in their culture, where they want to uh, oppress their women and, and feel like the woman has no value, and if, if she coughs wrong, they do an honor killing. That's them. That's not Islam. That's, what, yeah. That's their culture. When Africans came into Islam, that we, we got baggage, but we didn't have that particular problem. Our treatment of women. We, that was not our problem. Every culture has baggage. Mm -hmm. Africans included. We got baggage. But that particular problem, we didn't have that one. We shouldn't take that on. We shouldn't talk about our and we and our oppression of women. No, 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 no. Mm -mm. I guarantee you, if there's an African-American masjid or even a church that oppresses their women, you can set your stopwatch. That community will not exist too long. Because mm -hmm. the women run and they are the backbones of these communities. Yeah. Because this is our tradition. This is our history. Yeah. Nobody... All those exposés about masters where there was no place, no clean, well-lit place for women to worship. That wasn't African-American community. And I guarantee you, if they did go to an African-American community and show the sister uh, 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 a poorly lit or, or unkept sister's area, it was the whole masjid. It wasn't the sister, it was the brothers too. Because <laughs> <Right>? so, <laughs> we don't got the money to build these big luxurious masjids with, with marble and, and million dollar chandeliers. No. So, wow, these women in this African American community is being oppressed here. Look at their area. No, bring the cameras over here to the brother's side too. Mm -hmm. It's all of us. <laughs> it ain't just, right, it ain't yeah, just yeah. the sisters, right? Yeah, yeah. So, alhamdulillah. So, that was my long conclusion. Uh, my my wife has ordered me to close out. She give me orders. No, you close out, right? She thinks she running stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> Abdullah. May Allah bless all of y'all. Inshallah. Uh, tune in. We're going to try to stream live next Friday uh, evening from Camden, New Jersey, on our program dealing with uh, Black history as it relates to Islam. Inshallah. In, inshallah. So make sure you're tuning in. And don't be too busy to uh, 
not only watch and listen, but participate, inshallah. inshallah. Yeah, there'll be a lot of beneficial information. Inshallah. wa bihamdika nashadu wa la ilaha ila anta wa staghfuruku wa tubu ilayk. Wa la asra inna al-insana la fi khusra illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bilhaqi wa tawasaw bisara. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.